everybody. Welcome to Pale in Comparison. In this podcast, my sister uses her knowledge of the otherverse to take a look at Pact, Wildbow's least appreciated work, and I try to not give away any spoilers. I'm Jenny, and Malia convinced me to read Worm. I'm Malia, and Jenny convinced me to read everything else. This episode, we are covering Damages, chapters 2.3 and 2.4. Before we get into that, however, I'd like to issue a spoiler warning. This podcast is filled with pale spoilers. If you don't know whether Verona and Jeremy ever get together and don't want us to tell you, stop now, read pale, and come back to this podcast. As for Pact, there will be full spoilers through the chapters that we are covering. All right, so we'll go over our chapter summary. Um, How do you like these chapters, Malia? <laughs> I was, I was, thank, yay. Except I still don't know who Mr. Beasley is, but whatever. We're whatever. gonna get there. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so <laughs> basically, uh, Rose and Blake do some research to help their plan against Laird. They try to summon the lawyers, but nothing seems to happen. Then they have a conversation, you could say, with a ghost. And I mean, it's more than a conversation, but that's what I wrote down. So I have to just deal with that. <laughs> then the lawyers finally show up. Yay! They end up filling Blake and Rose in on some basic information um, that they're like, you guys should have known already. They offer Blake a job with a catch. Then... <laughs> They end up going on a walk with one of the players. Yay. Yay. <laughs> All right. So we'll start with Rose and Blake. Try to find some information on if their plan against Laird will work. They're not going to get any big backlash for that. Rose does find some information about ghosts that seems like it could be useful. And she tries to con Blake into doing more work. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I kind of misinterpreted or. Er- I couldn't tell if it was just like, haha, Blake, read this text, but like, don't really, because it wouldn't actually be useful. Or if it was like, oh, this would be useful for you to read this ridiculous text, because it kind of sounded more like a fun e maybe joke. But then Blake was actually kind of annoyed. But then she was like, well, I didn't want to have to read it all. And I'm like, wait, what? So I think that it was kind of something that they were like, we're probably gonna have to read this because it talks about like practitioner executions and stuff. So they were thinking mm-hmm. that they'd probably we're going to have to read it. So I think she was just trying to get out of doing the work. <laughs> just, yeah. The moment when she was like, I can't lift it. Like that was good. <laughs> yeah. That was great. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I also, I mean, I'm excited about this letter because I don't know what it means or what it's doing. And it's kind of like the other characters know. And I'm like, Ooh, what's going to happen. And um, in a way where I was like, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm very nervous about this plan. Yeah. But plans are fun i guess yeah helps that they got a little bit of an okay from the lawyers later on but Mm -hmm. still kind of like it's definitely a aggressive move there but yeah so then they attempt to summon the lawyers but nothing happens and then they go ghost hunting yeah we're gonna get to me being confused about the lawyers later but (laughs) i was thinking about how at some point they discuss that there's no Lord of Jacob's Bell, um, mm-hmm. which seems right based on what we've seen so far. And I'm just like really curious about this place and the history and like how the status quo developed and then kind of like became unbalanced if it's just Johannes or what else kind of has been happening. Because it mm. seems like maybe Johannes would want to be the Lord, but also maybe that's too much work. I can't tell if he's like, haha, I'm just going to play up here in like other Disney World or whatever, or if he's like, I mean, it seems like I like I'm kind of betting that he would be interested in it, um, like expanding his power or whatever. And then it really seems like Laird would want to. And like probably there's some Duchamps or whatever. It seems like maybe everyone just was sort of at an equal balance. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just I'm I'm excited to learn more about like how Lords and everything work. I don't For know. sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know. What would you compare it to like Pale? Um, I mean, we've heard about lords that are like the incarnation of cities or whatever in other places and we know that like judges kind of crop up where there aren't lords Mm -hmm. Eh, i don't (laughs) it seems like their like city council thing is like doing the work for both of those things okay yeah i just don't really yeah i mean their city council seems to but it's also like oh why has no one come in and like snapped everything up but i guess it's because it's like not that exciting until like it expands more like there's not maybe currently 
opportunity until they destroy Rhodes' house or whatever. Mm. Um, yeah, maybe. So I guess kind of backtracking, but like they, so Rose went over a bunch of information about Echoes um, and mm-hmm. basically could be potentially a good resource to use. Um, and so they were like, all right, well, maybe we should try to get an Echo. Yeah. Um, I mean, this was fun. Like, it was like a fun intro to the practice in terms of like an actual like shamanism little thing that they're doing. There was a salt circle, which was real exciting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's really useful to have Rose because she is, like, constantly able to read and absorb information. And she seems, mm-hmm. like, pretty smart and stuff. But it yes. was kind of like, oh, this was a huge fucking choke. Like, if the plan was, like, to take a Echo or a ghost and imbue it into an object, like, why was there absolutely no discussion about what Blake was bringing outside other than the salt? Like, he grabs yeah. the hatchet and the baseball bat, which was really smart because there were others around and you know whatever i was like oh good job grabbing the weapons but also like it, the plan seems like it was kind of to put the ghost into something but there was absolutely no discussion of like what should we put this ghost into yeah <laughs> um, and that was a big choke but it probably worked out or something yeah i mean it seems like it it did um <laughs> big salt circle which thank goodness everybody has salt it was a nice little refresher because I think we had learned this in Pale that I'd forgotten, but like the idea that salt is like pure and you need it like with the bindings, I think we learned about it um, mm, mm-hmm. where you need like things that are the opposite of like the other's nature or whatever. So salt wouldn't necessarily work against every other, I don't think, but for some of them, it like really, really does. Um, mm. I, I don't know if there is actually another that Salt Circle doesn't work against, but it just seems like maybe angels or something, like something similarly pure. What other kind of things do you think said Salt would work? Like, instead of having a Salt Circle? Oh, well, I mean, I think for this, just like a actual, like if they had, like a Chalk Circle would have worked. I, th- I was thinking Salt more in terms of like throwing it at people and having Does them Does it have to be pure Chalk? What if it has like color in it is pink well, chalk think, not gonna work as well no i think that like for drawing a circle it's like whatever but i think like that salt is just really useful because of its like defensive properties so i don't think that chalk like chalk would work insofar as drawing a line works but like the chalk wouldn't give it any oomph like salt would but, like what if you got like okay listen <laughs> like what if you got like a kitty pool and fill uh-huh. it with distilled water uh yeah i don't know i mean is that a perfect circle do they need to be perfect i mean they're pretty good at least i mean you can get a pretty good pretty circular kiddie pool i'm curious because like you didn't draw that circle but you filled it with distilled water creating a circular water shape um what if you got like big solid blocks of salt Mm -hmm. right and then like you put them into a circle and then just to extra overkill fill the circle of salt with distilled water you couldn't stand in the (laughs) distilled water you have to be like on a little pedestal thing because all your junk from your shoes would junk up the water but interesting yeah everyone listening to this is is just like you're (laughs) such an idiot (laughs) like you're yeah, you're an idiot. And I, I understand I mean, that. Distilled but water seems like it could also be good. It could. The problem is once you pour if you pour it onto the ground, then it's not really distilled anymore because it's got all that junk. So you'd have to have mm. a sterile surface. So I wonder if you'd like got like some can sterile you sterilize like a kitty pool. I mean, you can. Cause mm. the main re- way that they like sterilize at least like surgical drapes and stuff like that is like mm-hmm. through chemicals. Hmm. So you could, I mean, I don't know, actually getting someone to do it <laughs> would be really <laughs> freaking hard to do. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry for wasting everyone's time with this line of thought. Practitioners can do anything they put their mind to. So that's right. They could sanitize a kiddie pool. They could sanitize a kiddie pool. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just thinking outside the box. Okay. You never know what kind of weird, weird stuff's out there. <laughs> I'd, I'd be a paranoid practitioner. I'd be like trying to do multiple circles of things, probably. Mm, mm-hmm. So, so yeah, they basically their power source that they have 
to use is like Blake's blood, essentially, which kind of unfortunate. I I've been trying to like reread Pale by mostly like listening to the audiobook project, and I actually just re-listened to Nicolette's interlude, and this was mm. like kind of a useful interlude to have listened to right before this because she talks about like oh their their circles and runes are ungrounded or whatever and i was kind of like yeah this salt circle seems pretty basic i wonder if she would you know scoff at it but then also she has her like 10 vials of blood or whatever that like come from different that were like shed in different emotional circumstances or whatever and therefore have different like powers kind of Mm -hmm. um but also i was just thinking about like is doing this with blood mean that he's not also siphoning his self off or is this like a conduit to siphon his self off i'm kind of thinking the first one but i was really mm-hmm. worried about it the first time going through like wait no like, like no you can't just fucking give yourself to this echo True. but and it was also interesting because when like he gets salt in his cut and like the connection flares more mm-hmm. like it reacts mm-hmm. more i was like oh is this like bloodshed and pain now and therefore like does it give it more of an oomph and more of a boost because now it's blood from like a certain context or whatever like Nicolette's was I wasn't sure Blake thought maybe it had like fucked with stuff but I don't I don't necessarily think so this is another random question <laughs> I'm sorry guys I just thought of this right now but going back to Nicolette's interlude because she does have all those vials of blood right like how old do you think those are because like she did she doesn't have people mm. like on call right that she's just grabbing blood from so I'm assuming no. that they're at least like at least like a few months old if yeah, not yeah. More, right yeah how does she keep them from clotting okay no they explain this in the chapter <laughs> oh do they okay t- remind me because i don't remember they're in special i don't remember if it's one circle for all of them or if they each have a circle but they're in like a diagram that prevents them from the word doesn't they don't use the word clotting it's like solid whatever that keeps them liquid keeps them liquid okay yeah well it's actually she- mentioned good job webbo Good job. You thought of everything. Fantastic. I <laughs> did not remember that. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I figured it was something either practitionery or that she stole some heparin um, from like a hospital <laughs> or something, um, <laughs> which, you know, that's fair. But yeah, if I hadn't been listening to the audiobook, I probably wouldn't have caught it at all because I tend to skip details like that when I'm uh, just sort of reading. But yeah, it stuck out. I was like, oh, because that's was, like, really she clever. didn't move it from the circle. I was like, OK, <laughs> OK. I love it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, we can go back to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I was going to start talking about how echoes are real cool, but if That's you cool. wanted to ask more. Yeah, okay. No. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just really like this idea of ghosts. Echoes aren't someone's soul or someone's spirit. You know, like they're not like, oh, that's grandpa or whatever. It's like, oh, that's like a really emotional moment in grandpa's life that left an impression on the universe. And I like that they're not like translucent. I like that they have a script because they are like that one moment frozen in time. And so they have like only certain things that they can say and like can only move in certain ways. Like when it was like, oh, she was like walking down the hill. But when like the echo didn't have like the like not the memory, but just like didn't have the data to like walk down the hill in a certain way she would like disappear and then reappear Mm, mm -hmm. um and like that's just so neat i just really love it um as a concept of like i mean it to me it makes echoes less scary than ghosts something about it like i mean they just don't have nearly Mm. as much agency or control or like willpower or will at all but it's such a neat idea that like others and spirits and things are derived from human experiences so it makes sense that there would be certain others that are just like what's left over from super intense situations no for sure yeah no i love it It, it's very well (laughs) thought out (laughs) Mm -hmm. and now that we've just talked about how cool echoes are i want to talk about (laughs) the moral implications of this whole thing (laughs) okay (laughs) because i'm really i'm really torn i'm really conflicted So, like, this echo is, like, an incarnation of suffering, right? Like, it's not, like... I mean, it is experiencing suffering because that is what it is. Uh Uh-huh. Relieving the echo of its suffering is to, like, destroy it. It's to, like, make it go away. Not, like, yeah, it, like, it won't be a thing anymore because it is suffering, right? Um, Yeah. 
And so, like, from what I can see, there are, like, three scenarios that a practitioner, like, for how a practitioner can interact with an echo, right? So, like, they just leave it alone, right? Or they can use it, like what Blake and Rose do, or they can destroy it, right? Um, yeah. Hopefully by, you know, making it feel better and then it dissipates or whatever. And I'm just like, what is what is right? Because the June's echo does maybe seem to be a little bit happy. Like she she chooses the hatchet, right? That was a cool moment where like she like chooses that. She's like, oh, the axe and the fire and like goes and picks that and like yeah. shows some agency, which was cool. And Blake seems to think that she maybe like is a little bit less cold or like, you know, maybe feels a little bit better. Like she had a choice in this situation. So maybe in a way this is the best option. But mm-hmm. until the moment where she like actively chooses to do that thing i just felt really like skeevy about the whole situation because yeah. blake points out like echoes like are one step away from vestiges you know like this is yeah. like almost you rose like this you know well and i didn't know what to do it's also like in this situation blake and rose like don't have the choice they need to be practitioners they're basically forced into it um mm-hmm they don't have to go around collecting echoes or whatever. Like this doesn't have to be their power source, but like they need a power source or they're going to die. Yeah. Like, does that mitigate some of the moral ickiness of this slash? Is it maybe not as morally icky as it seems because they are able to give June's echo some of what it wants? Well, also, but also like actually like making it warm and whatever would destroy it and leave it unable for them to use i don't know what do you think <laughs> it's hard um I, it's one of those things where i feel like there, you know if there's not like a right and wrong answer to it mm-hmm. um but in my opinion i mean the most moral thing to do when you're encountering an echo probably would be to destroy it <laughs> because mm-hmm. you're like like i guess fulfill the wishes or whatever and then it doesn't need to be there anymore because mm-hmm. then you're getting rid of that bit of suffering However, mm. realistically for Blake and Rose, that's, I mean, they're in a tough spot, man. <laughs> like, mm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's if it's pretty much like this, like they use this Echo, or they try to get more power by following their practice, which is a terrible idea, um, mm-hmm. or, or basically end up dying, you know? Mm. I feel like, you know, they didn't really have much of a choice in terms of that, but I don't know. It, it is hard, but I feel like they do try to... At least they recognize, or at least Blake recognizes that it's just kind of shitty. And they're like, right. well, we'll try to keep you as warm as we can, even though we can't really keep you warm. <laughs> but right. You just pointed out that, like, Blake recognizes it. And I find that really interesting. Like, maybe another sign of Blake's past experiences as an outcast from society is, like, helping him empathize more. Because Rose calls mm. him out and is like, oh, is that because it's a damsel in distress? And he's like, no, it's because it's you. Um, <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah. like she doesn't recognize this as necessarily prob or like she doesn't want to recognize that or whatever until Blake points it out, even though she is another and she is trapped and she, I don't know, but like, yeah. I mean, she probably also, well, I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like if I was in her position, I'd probably be a bit in denial. Yeah, that's true. In terms of like, I don't really want to face that like, this is pretty much what I am. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. um, especially something staring right in front of me that's a simpler version of, you know, her. But, mm-hmm. you know, that's kind of a hard thing to have to face. Yeah. But. Yeah. I I also think that Rose is looking for a solution to their problem, right? And, like, they need power. And it, this seems to be the best way to get it in terms of, like, the possibly least risky way. And also, yeah. like possibly most effective way because i mean june seems to be fairly strong i mean not like the strongest thing out there or whatever but like she seems to have a decent amount of power and like blake felt like he was burning or whatever you know like that just seems like practically this does seem like a good workable solution especially considering the fact that like their woods are presumably filled with ghosts because no one goes back there or whatever Um, that's true i'm like appreciative of rose's uh, she's coming up with ideas. She wants, you know, she wants to solve this problem. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it just like, but it's like Blake, who's the more sympathetic one, I guess. I don't know. It's it's really interesting. 
Yeah. I mean, that's kind of why they're a good team, even though they clash mm-hmm. quite a bit, right? Because mm-hmm. they've got those different, like, different viewpoints that both of them kind of need at different mm-hmm. points. Kind of want to go back to the notes here because you wrote something that I feel like is good to address as well as you're kind of writing that um, during when they were trying to bind June, essentially, and like or have this conversation, um, she wasn't really responding to Blake that well. But when mm-hmm. Rose was talking, she was responding to her much better. Um, mm-hmm. And why do you think that is? I So on my second read through, I was kind of like, I don't know if it's because Blake is a man. I was like, oh, I don't know if I buy that. Mm. But I feel like that's probably what it is. I mean, I wrote something where it was like, I wonder if it's actually that Rose is like doing the practicing and Blake is like the conduit. And that's why like Rose is the Mm -hmm. one that needed to speak. Um, Okay. But I I don't, I I didn't like, I don't fully buy that. Um, Especially because later with the lawyers, I feel like they talk about, I mean, Blake at one point is worried that Rose is, like, siphoning power from him. And, like, maybe that's happening because they are connected. Um, Mm -hmm. And then the lawyers... When Miss Lewis is like, hey, y'all, you gotta stop fucking lying. (laughs) Rose is like, oh, like, you know, does this impact me too? Or, like, do I need to do this too? And she was like, yeah, insofar as you are connected to Blake, like, this impacts him. I'm kind of going off the assumption that Rose didn't like straight up didn't awaken like the spirits didn't move and whatever like I think she's can't lie because she's an other not because she's a practitioner and like I could super be wrong but like then the idea that Rose is the one doing the practice here and Blake is the one like that she is working through is real interesting Um, yeah Blake definitely can practice we've seen that but Uh she was not responding to Blake (laughs) You don't think it's just because he got salt in his, like, his cut or whatever? Well, okay, but when he got salt (laughs) in his cut, it responded more, right? The connection got stronger. And then there was the interesting Mm -hmm. thing of, like, Rose said June's name, and then it, like, the connection, like, transferred over to Blake? Which, again, makes it seem like it's kind of, like, doing the thing, but also maybe, like, it's not, I don't know. There And, like, I still don't, we still don't know why... Grandma had to create Rose. Yeah. Like, why did it have to be a girl? Unless she just fucking said it one time and then it was like, oh, fuck, I should stop saying things. <laughs> but I don't know that she would fuck up that way twice. You'd hope not. But yeah. And I mean, the, the mom was the scary one too, Rose's mom. So it seems like maybe there's something about women. But yeah. Hmm. Like, I could totally be convinced that. Rose is the one actually doing the practicing and like just like whatever is like the necessary thing that exists or whatever uh because yeah. I've managed to convince myself of some interesting things in the story already but I don't <laughs> quite buy it yet <laughs> okay all right well, we'll see as the story goes on if you keep to that or if you change your mind or all right yeah. let me see you also make a note that like obviously like Blake's pretty affected by this echo but Rose isn't yeah what the fuck I <laughs> just and she seems to be like, you're going to be affected and I'm not. You like, you know, she's like, listen to me because no matter what you're feeling, like I, you know, listen to my voice. And he's like, okay, listen to Rose. So like, she seems to know that like, it's not going to fuck her up. And I'm like, is that because the mirror, like you're not out there slash Blake's the one who draws the thing and writes the thing. So maybe like he's really practicing and she's just telling what to do. That seems more likely. This all seems more likely. I don't know. I'm sus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or like you're sus. I'm sus of your sus. That's what we were at. All right. I mean, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. So yeah, she's she chooses the hatchet, which is pretty cool. Which I, I like just want. Yes. Yeah. And I just want to give a throwback. To, I'm pretty sure. I don't know if you remember this, Malia, but I'm sorry, Scott, if you're listening. But just a throwback to we've got worm. Um, the fire axe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Throw back to the fire axe because that was probably that was like one of the highlights. I feel like um, this is like an ice axe. To. Exactly. This is like <laughs> this is the ice a- the ice hatchet. Um, the ice hatchet, as opposed to the fire axe. But it's an yeah. actual ice hatchet. You probably could use it to chop ice too, which is pretty. Neat, you know. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. I just I, had, <laughs> I thought of it. Just had to had to bring it up. 
That's the yeah. idea. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and then at the end when they go back into the house, I feel like Rose is like, or somebody says like something about a half implement, half familiar. And I was like, wait, no, don't make June your implement familiar. Like this could be a good way to get one, but you, you, we are not ready for this level of commitment. And so like that might not be what is going on, but I was also like, wait, no, like make some more of these. Like don't. Yeah. Don't, don't want to be like, I'm just throwing out references here. Okay. Well, like, yeah, you don't want to be like Anna and frozen for like, she just meets that guy and it's like, <laughs> Oh, we're going to get married. Like this is, Serious commitment, serious shit. You don't want to be like that. Okay. Yeah. And and June's lovely and hatchets are cool, but this does not seem like the epitome of, I don't know, Blake's yeah. person. Blake is a Blake. <laughs> <laughs> Plus he has to bond Rose or I'm wrong. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, basically they go back inside and who's there? The lawyers! The lawyers! <laughs> so they go over a lot of information and they offer Blake a job with the firm and time um, with a pretty hefty catch. But Malia, the lawyers! Yay! Yes! I'm so, uh. <laughs> when Jenny was like, oh, we're going to read these chapters, she was also like, oh, you're going to like these. And I was like, the lawyers. <laughs> so I was like, what else is happening? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Okay, I just have to ask, like, when you were first reading that first chapter and, like, the lawyers didn't show up, how disappointed were you? Like, a lot. A lot. And, like, confused. <laughs> um, Like, so, so it seems like these are not, these people are not based in Jacob's Bell. It seems like there's some sort of, like, possibly international, like, firm, whatever. And so I'm both, like, confused that he had to call them twice and confused that they got there so fast. Like I'm like both like, did they not hear him in the house the first time? Or because like Miss Lewis talks about how like, you know, not very many things around in the house to listen, but like they can definitely get in the house. So I'm not sure. Or did it just like take them a minute? Um, Cause I mean like Miss would show up like immediately. Right. But she also like is an other. Whereas these dudes are quasi human. And Yeah. Just randomly, I'm pretty sure he called them three times. Or do you mean that they he, he did once inside and one once outside? Yeah, that one. Oh, okay, because I was like, he said them three times. Um, right, no, no, no. All right. Okay. I also was like, what? What are these names? Where is Mr. Beasley? <laughs> like, do we meet Mr. Beasley ever? Doesn't matter. I don't get it. But yeah, that's why I'm assuming they weren't at the council meeting because I don't think that they live in Jacob's Bell. I don't think that like they are involved in like the practitioner council structure also like offering blake a job it makes me wonder like will they make him get a law degree does their like does what they do have actually anything to do with law because like if he has to go to law school that'd be hilarious and like sucks blake like <laughs> you gotta go learn torts in order to like erase your family's karmic debt like <laughs> bummer <laughs> also rose was real freaked out when they showed up and i don't know why <laughs> I don't know if it was like a Mariska moment where she like they like showed their true face or whatever, or if it she was just like, wow, there's three people sitting on our couch. But like, I don't know, Blake was chill about it. I don't know. It's not the weirdest thing that's happened to them. Maybe it just didn't like click that they were the lawyers at first, and like this, the house is supposed hmm. to be safe from everybody essentially, except for I guess the lawyers, right? Maybe it seemed like possibly more than that, but. I mean, be, we'll find out if it was probably. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So get to mean um, the firm. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> is it man, Martin and Lewis? Um, what do you think? Miss Lewis fucking rules. Um, I mean, we'll get into it more later, but I really like her. The other two, I don't even know which one was which. And I like, didn't care. I'm kind of <laughs> like interested in so far as like, they're gonna, maybe show up more or whatever. But like, I was just like, yeah, Ms. Lewis is great. Um, yeah. I'm also kind of going off the assumption that they like freeze in time when they accept the deal. Um, so knowing that that one guy accepted the deal so young is really kind of hardcore. 
But that also might not be true because they like lose parts of their identity and so possibly like their appearance or whatever is like wrapped up in that. But I was like, like at first I was like, holy crap, like this like 20 something year old main name partner. Like that's nuts. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they said specifically like, you know, you could become a man like or like, you could become like one of the names, you know. Right. That was <laughs> just funny. Interesting. I think I said Man Martin and Lewis, by the way. It's Man Levin and Lewis. I don't know where I got Man Martin Levin from. I just made that up, I guess. I don't know. Just in case everyone was like, oh my, you're supposed oh, to have so run the story. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Levin. I don't know where I got Martin from. But Levin. anyway, as we go on. <laughs> yeah, I'm also like real mad in like the core of my soul because these goddamn layers. <laughs> are diabolists and they're not karmic law practitioners unless they're not that i don't i just mm, bleh, like who they're i thought mm, mm. <laughs> i'm so sorry it's gonna be okay it's not what is it i just i need to know i need someone to tell me uh, <laughs> uh wildo has some mercy on my sister and like Please. Let her know it. Please. <laughs> I need to know. I mean, like, maybe it'll come up in this story, but, like, the ch- it's living through my fingers. I'm, like, so sad. But you get a bunch of lost stuff anyway, right? I do get lost stuff. You could, you do get lost stuff. Yeah. Um, and I feel, I feel like, I don't know about you, but I feel like it's kind of hilarious that, like, <laughs> the main lawyers are, like, diabolists, right? It's really good. <sighs> but it's also funny. really annoying. I mean, it makes sense that, like, why else would you sign up for this unless you had, like, crazy amounts of karmic debt because you, like, lose yourself or whatever. I'm curious yeah. as to, like, what happens when, like, if somebody takes their place or whatever or, like, at the end of their sentence or whatever, like, what happens to them? Do they just, like, die or do they actually get to, like, live their life? Because it doesn't seem like a super great deal if they just fucking die, but also, like... I guess it's better than I mean, it might be. the karmic debt <laughs> comparison. Yeah. It depends yeah. how the but job is. But also just, it seems like a bad job for a lot of reasons. But like the idea that you'd want someone to replace you so that you could just like cease to exist is like kind of hardcore. Yeah. Um, I also really love that they're like really big on the timing, the whole interaction for those who don't know, most lawyers bill in six minute increments. So you track your time. You track every six minutes. Um, (laughs) That is so weird. Yeah. Well, because because that's a tenth of an hour, right? Um, Yeah. So you're supposed to figure out like, oh, I spent, you know, 1.2 hours doing this project for this client. And then you bill them like that. So in effect, in effect, you're billing in six minute increments. So like everything you do, (laughs) it's like, can I bill this to this client and whatever Um, for public interest? It's not necessarily as hardcore because you often aren't billing clients in the same way, but you still want to track most of the time you work on cases in six minute increments in like a relatively detailed way. Because if you win a case that requires the other side to pay attorney's fees, you submit all of that information to the court and you, it is like tracked in a similar way or whatever. So I got to have fun with six minute increments my last (laughs) summer. Um, but it wasn't like as stressful as like because you're billing the, like you're you know to a specific client and this is their time and blah blah blah. But it was real. Right. I just I liked that a lot. I was like, <laughs> That's yeah, it's real. Huh. Yeah. Oh, the other thing that was really funny is like Miss Lewis was like, like this was just like a huge big law trope and I loved it. Like Miss Lewis was like, I've been working for three days, so I'm doing a break for an hour and like like you lose <laughs> your identity and yourself and everything you wanted, like because like kind of because money and just like I'm sure there are people out there who enjoy big law but kind of the narrative in law school is that you do this because you're going to make a lot of money um and you're going to work like 80 to 100 hour weeks and um you're just like down there in the like muck or whatever I mean you're not literally muck but like you have to like work your way up and do all these things and like if like you don't have the potential to make partner they'll just kind of like fire you after so long or whatever it just sounds like real awful um just why i don't want to do it but they make money 
you sell your soul for the money. <laughs> My friend's a lawyer, and uh, I I told you about this, right, Malia? Like, he's mm-hmm. kind of he's doing that same thing right now, and he like hates it and is trying to get out. But yeah, it's like insane, I mean, like yeah. how much he he like pretty much has to drop everything, like if he gets a call. Yeah. Um, it sounds yeah. awful. <laughs> and I mean, it. I try not to, like. I mean, okay. So if you're like coming from a rich family and you're going to work for some like firm that represents a bunch of like oil whatever like i judge you (laughs) Um, (laughs) not gonna lie but for a lot of people especially like people of color and like other people who are coming in and getting this law degree i try really really hard to not immediately judge them when they say something about big law because like student loans are real and also like people are coming from backgrounds where they don't have like you know, lots of wealth and maybe they want to like provide for their family and maybe they want to like do other things. And I mean, like, I still don't want those people to work for oil companies or like things that are like actively harming the environment. But if they're going to go like make a bunch of companies, like become one bigger company, I mean, it's not great, but it could be worse. (laughs) True. Yeah. Well, yeah, my friend's not working for an oil company, but it is kind of a similar situation to where like grew up with not a lot of money and is trying to help support like his mom and stuff. Um, yeah. So I'm like, I see why you're doing it, but that freaking sucks, man. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah that sucks. <laughs> yeah, it sucks that it's such a grueling environment. Yeah. As well. So, talking about the contract, I guess. Um, yeah, the contract wasn't a good option for naming this. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no. So. It's more just like what the why people work at the firm, I guess. Pretty much, yeah. It's basically like, well, you have so much karmic debt, you don't have any choice, essentially. So hmm. uh, you come to work for us, and if yeah. there's any family that fits that, it's, <laughs> it's this family. It, it's this family. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to talk about, because I still am confused about karma, and I it seems to me like maybe packed readers have a slight edge just because this is this seems to be such a large part of the story. Whereas like going back through pale, I'm noticing it a lot more, but it's so far hasn't been like crucial that I fully understand how karma works. It's like you accrue karma, maybe through like getting people to do things for you. And then you not like doing anything in return or something, but like you accrue bad karma. And then if you're like smart and clever enough, you can like deal with the fact that your karma fucking sucks and continue to survive basically. (laughs) And then it like reaches this like, crucial like bad point where like the universe is going to try to write itself by like they described like pulling too hard and it's snapping um Mm. and i mean this is fun because like this is an in-world explanation for why things are going to be hard for the protagonist because like blake has bad karma and so like this is a it's like in the wheel of time there's um something called tavirin which is basically just like shit's gonna go your way or whatever and that's like the in-world explanation but this is a much better one uh love you robert jordan but still um (laughs) like in terms of why things are really not gonna go blake's way i'm assuming from almost all this book but also there's also the little thing built in where like but it can't constantly not go your way because that's too obvious and so like it's just it's real fun but um there seemed to be something about like okay if you pull too hard and it snaps back, that's akin to like dying a really violent death and it'll like decrease a little bit of the karmic debt, but like eh or something. And that Molly maybe like chose that, which was like also super heartbreaking. I like that they said yeah. she was clever. I just, ugh, Molly. Molly. I know. <laughs> oh my God. Is there an echo of Molly being tortured? Because man, <laughs> do not want. But also, I want to talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, option two, um, <laughs> is join the firm, well, which almost seems like it's not that bad. I'm just curious as to like what their day to day is or whatever. I mean, it like seems like their clients are super awful. Like Miss Lewis seems like a person with a moral compass who is now in a situation like she, she's like, oh, I really like you, Blake, or whatever, because you like aren't a piece of shit who would use Barbatorum and not feel bad about it. Um, yeah. And, like, the fact that she can only practice, basically, or, like, only, quote-unquote, use her power when she's on the clock is real weird and annoying. 
I wonder what cool special powers they have based on that. Because, I mean, she is doing the practice by finding June into the hatchet, from what I understand. But it's not necessarily mm. like, ooh, magical powers. I don't know. Yeah. Um, But, like, I think that if Grandma was like, no, I'm not going to fucking do it, you probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> I mean, Grandma Rose is not a coward. Grandma Rose is a very independent woman, and she's not going to, like, she wouldn't, I can't see her doing it, but that was what, yeah, made me think, like, oh, don't do it. Like, what do you think her main reason was for not doing it? Do you think it was because the job sucks or because, like, the demons get a hold on humanity? I I think that the demons getting a greater foothold on humanity was maybe part of it, um, because that does suck. I say somewhere in the notes that that's kind of like a public goods problem or whatever it's called. Where, like, say there's a park or, like, you know, like, the environment, right? Like, I could go completely vegan and, like, do all this stuff and it, like, won't actually really help. But, like, and I could, like, be really, really, really horrible and it won't really actually hurt. But, like, all of us doing it in aggregate is what, like, fucks everything up. And, Mm. like, I personally could get a lot of, like, benefit out of being a shithead. And if everyone does that, it's, like, a really big problem. Yeah. Um, but, like, it's, like, I don't, I mean, I think that Grandma doesn't like demons. I think that she kind of resented maybe having that as her pri- But she also was real fucking fascinated by them. No, I'm like, okay, no. Grandma did not want to join the firm primarily because um, Grandma doesn't want to be forgotten. Mm. Her whole thing with Minnie, right, is, like, I am so afraid of the universe rewriting itself and me like basically not having existed in anyone's mind. And it seems like that's what Uh, happens if you join the firm. Um, Okay. And I think that's that's maybe that and she doesn't want people to tell her what to do are probably the two biggest factors for grandma Rose not taking this deal. So they do get kind of a few things kind of settled, which is nice, which is like an errand boy for groceries, which yeah, thank goodness because Holy crap. (laughs) Um, like, no more canned tuna and beans and whatever else they have. <laughs> Oatmeal and... Oh, yeah. Like, uh, powdery hot chocolate. Yeah, it's like, I probably never want to eat, eat any of that again. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Blake doesn't really have to marry a man, necessarily, but it might be <laughs> for the best if he it was does. so funny. He was like, but you should do it. I was like... <laughs> like, you don't Why? have to, but you probably should. Because it's going to be better. <laughs> It was exciting getting an actual measurement of the amount of karma, but I'm like, how do you know? Because, like, seven lifetimes worth of unpaid karmic balance, I'm like, how is that measured? And also, does that mean that unless they, like, take this deal, there's absolutely no way that Blake can resolve it, you know? Yeah. Um, this, this story, again, probably isn't going to, and the debt was repaid and everything's great, but, like, there needs to be some sort of resolution on this, it feels like. Even, Yeah. We've talked about this a little bit before, I think, but just, I don't know. I, that's so overwhelming. (laughs) Yes. But yeah, so they basically are asking some basic questions. I kind of wanted to ask, and I guess I could save this for more the pale comparison part at the end, but I'm not going to, because I just thought of this, but (laughs) um, I guess like, just because if you think about like this section here is kind of where packed readers for the first time, like found out a lot of this basic info, right? Because mm. this is where, like, Blake is talking to the lawyers. I guess, is there anything that, like, any other information that you got from this that you didn't have before reading Pale? Or has this changed, like, any way, like, your read on anything at all? I'm just kind of curious. I'm still really confused by the description of how the universe works. And, like, what karma is doing. And okay. what, how it's supposed to function. But it was a more thorough and concrete explanation, I feel like. Like, it was kind of more in one chunk than it has been before. And I thought it was really... Like, I think it's like I'm more appreciating how powerful karma is in this universe. Yeah. Um, and I think, like, the... Like, similarly, the the whole lying thing and, like, sarcasm that likely depleted Blake's power in a way that he wouldn't have noticed because like, you're not going to notice. I don't know if that's something I had like super connected with, but that was really interesting that like, yeah, lying means that you're not going to have the power when you reach for it. 
when yeah. you won't, and you won't necessarily realize that. I mean, as in Pale, we have like the three protagonist, protagonists that have like pretty like decent karma. I'd say, all things considered, um, mm-hmm. like um, at the very least, like even if it's closer than new- to neutral, it's like a hell of a lot better than Blake's here. So it's like you don't really yeah. think about it quite as much um, because yeah. it's not something. Because I mean, they've they've got it kind of made. Um, I mean, yeah. like looking at, I mean, especially like Pact is the first like other story. You know, a lot of us have read, so it's like going to pale. It's like, geez, these guys are handed like the freaking jackpot. They have like not only like I mean decent karma, but they have like a ton of power already and all that. You know, um, right? No, it's. I mean, it, going back to like the echoes thing, like how is how are practitioners supposed to practice in a way that is moral? Because like. Lucy and Verona and Avery seem to do a fairly good job, but that's because they have like a immense and very willing power source. Um, yeah. I mean, less so after the hungry choir is dealt with, but still like they never have to think or worry about it. Whereas Nicolette obsesses over it. Right. And like, yeah. like Lucy worries about it when she uses the weapon ring. Right. But as long as she has the hot lead or whatever, it's like, she's fine. Um, uh, uh-huh. I mean, they have, like, a never-ending supply of glamour almost. Like, it just, like, it's, yeah. it makes for a very, very fun story, but it is a little nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like that just gets highlighted the more that you see, like, the difference between these two stories. <laughs> yeah. And I wonder how, if the others can really feel, oh, they've taken a lot of my power, and if they kind of resent it. Or if, like, it's not as bad because there's so many of them, and if it's kind of, I don't know. Like, in... Uh, in, in in pale, I mean, it, it was the deal they made, right? And I think it's still like mm-hmm. a fairly small percentage of their power, if mm-hmm. I'm remembering correctly. But I mean, they made the deal, so they should mm-hmm. be like relatively cool with it, as long as mm-hmm. they're not like using stuff frivolously, which I feel like they're pretty good about for the most part. Yeah, I mean, maybe Bronus a cat too often or something but (laughs) (laughs) but i mean i feel like it's okay well they end their meeting a little bit early which saves a little bit of time for later in the month which is nice and so miss lewis basically accompanies blake to try to drop off that letter yeah yeah i thought it was interesting how i mean it was it's a nice lesson in the practice and different little things that matter she kind of like I mean, I, I don't think she drew it out enough explicitly, but you kind of charged them for not, like, offering a drink and stuff. Um, yeah. Part of me was like, oh, they, like, don't have time. Like, if they only have 30 minutes or whatever, like, just fucking ask the questions. But, like, they also maybe suffered a little bit of a karmic hit by not being, like, quote unquote, good hosts. But she's like, oh, if you take the letter yourselves, like, this is better because reasons. And um, I don't know. I just really appreciate her generosity with her time and willingness to help out i think she just like misses being around like decent people probably um, yeah like at the end of when blake is like oh what if i swore right now to never ever like join y'all or whatever um she says like i would respect you for it like i would understand and i don't know i just really like her and i mean it's like kind of it's like oh she's gonna bind this other in this thing better than they would have been able to so that's cool like i don't know i just like yeah that's pretty neat yeah she's pretty great <laughs> Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's nice because, like, it's free time, but she's um, still kind of walking and kind of talking about, like, giving them some advice, like, basically telling them, like, oh, you guys, like, gotta be careful with that dishonesty because mm. using sarcasm and using, like, she's like, you've outright, each outright lied at least once in the 30 minutes before her, <laughs> which is like, ooh, that's pretty bad. It's really neat that she can see that, though. See, this makes me think they're karmic law practitioners. Like, how the fuck could you see that? I don't know. Just, like, no one in Pale is like, ooh, look, like, your karma meter's low. Let's fucking get it. Um, yeah. Where she knows within the last 30 minutes that they straight up lied. Like, I just... <sighs> anyway. I mean, maybe, like, as <laughs> since they're her clients, um, and they need to keep track of, like, the karmic debt anyway. Maybe she can kind of gauge it that way. Maybe. But... I know you really want this karmic law thing. I really I want it. I mean, they pretty much straight up said, like, they were... Uh, yeah, Diabolus I mean, or whatever, yeah. yeah. I just... Maybe they're both. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I mean... I know. Yeah. 
Uh. <laughs> Seems so useful. Um, how can I like, you know, make a persona on that one packed for a subreddit? If I don't know what a karmic law practitioner is, like, what would I even do? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm sure we'll get more information at some point, even if it's not <laughs> in the story. Uh, okay. Yes. Which I know you're like, oh, hopefully she's saying, yeah, no. Um, even if it's not in the story, I'm sure we'll get more information about it sometime. I'll just but go we'll read all see. the pack die stuff in two years or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, I know I should read some and see if I can find any information and then just not tell you about it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so she kind of goes over, she doesn't call it gainsaying, but she kind of goes over gainsaying um, and lying mm-hmm. and stuff and talks about how, I think you kind of talked about this earlier, but like, yeah, Rose lying only seems to matter because she's connected to Blake and that weakens them both, you know? Mm-hmm. So she, yeah, so she basically starts like kind of mentoring or advising him, like being like using his site more and be like, oh, look, like, you know, you're being followed and you're actually in danger right now. Did you realize that? And of course you're like, mm. nope. <laughs> Cause of course, if they go anywhere, they're going to be followed and attacked by people just because that's how it is. Unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Well, it was interesting that like the Briar girl, like seems to be wanting his attention and like maybe his help. And yeah. like, that's a fun thread. We'll get to pick up soon. I bet. Um, and I'm really curious as, more as to how, like, she and her familiar work so that'll be fun yeah that's pretty interesting yeah but yeah so we see briar girl but then also she's not the only one um (laughs) (laughs) they see the car pass and blake takes a few minutes to figure out but he uses a site to kind of like i guess seek connections or Mm -hmm. i don't know basically figure out who it is so the do shops right do champs Mm -hmm. do shops (laughs) <laughs> I'm never going to say anything right. And <laughs> they're basically like, wait, like, Miss Lewis, aren't, you're not going to actually, like, fight them or anything? And she's like, nah. I'm Rose not was going so to. mad. It was really funny. <laughs> yeah. And then again, she's like, I was very clear. Don't start crying now. I was <laughs> just, like, you just... weren't very clear, but okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I guess clear enough. Um, and the practitioner said she must have been, but I don't know. Yeah. I was also sort of surprised. Just, I'm like trying to see if it says it specifically, and it doesn't. So I'm just like, the very last, like, I guess it's like a bird made its way into the alley, and then it unfolded, putting me face to face with a woman so beautiful she looked artificial. And it gives this <laughs> uh, description it has snow settled on platinum colored hair and bare shoulders. Um,. Wearing in between a Japanese um, yukata and a high fashion dress. I might expect to see it a runway. And her eyes were pale and she drew a sword slowly and like it was like 12 feet long. So what is that? <laughs> I mean, my 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 thought was glamour. I was like, I don't know if she's like a fade duelist or whatever. But I okay. mean, like in pale people transform into birds or whatever when they use glamour and... They, I don't know. She's like that beautiful, and she like her her sword doesn't seem like it could be that long. She couldn't wear it if it was that long. Like it would just drag around. Um, and like, I mean, to me, this like screamed glamour, but I could be wrong. Okay, so possibly glamour, possibly fade duelist. Okay, um, yeah. I mean, because I, I know that they're enchantresses, but I don't really know what that means. So, well, true. Okay. We'll we'll see. Um, So are you thinking this is a practitioner that's like using, using glamour or or something or like, (gasps) I just assumed it was one of the Duchamps. Wait. (laughs) Well, I mean, Duchamps are a practitioner, like a practitioner family. So that'd still be accurate. Right. So, so I said like, like, I don't know if they like bound a fairy and sent them in there. That seems like not going to happen from these fucking schmucks in this town. I made a deal with them. I guess it could be another. I just really thought it was a Duchamp. I don't know, man. It might be. I'm just, I'm, that's why I just said, like, you think it's just like a practitioner using glamour. No, uh, no, I don't anymore. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what do you think it is? 
then you're like, I don't know. Could be. Uh, I don't think it's a fairy. Okay. Just because, well, like, I mean, maybe he would have said, like, it looks like that one lady. I just assumed it was one of them. I don't know. I mean, it could still be one of them. I didn't say it's not. Okay. I know. <laughs> it didn't occur to me to it at all. Uh, yeah, okay, fine. It's, <laughs> it's still just one of them. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I mean, glamour does, like, some crazy glamoury things, you know? And then Miss Lewis is basically like, take some breaths, shoulders square, chin up. And I'm going to walk you through this. Pay attention. And then she's like, the less guidance I can, do you demand for me, the faster I can give this hatchet to you. <laughs> just like, okay. It's Shit's so good. going down. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm real hype. Yeah, it's pretty great. So, okay. So, obviously, like, this is our first mention of an echo, um, mm-hmm. which I'm trying to think if they actually referred it. They haven't said it yet. No. They haven't really referred it to an echo yet, but it's an echo. Does this seem pretty similar to what we've seen in Pale in terms of echoes or what we know about them or like similarities and differences here? Yeah, I think that um, the first echo I remember from Pale was the one who Nicolette's collector stole the eyes from um, Mm -hmm. when they were like making the rounds with Alpi or whatever. Okay. Um, and this seemed familiar in the sense of like, there's a set script, and if you take the echo too far away from that or whatever, and challenge whatever's going on too much, they'll like start to break down. Um, okay. And so there's a certain way you have to like ask them questions and different things. I mean, it was interesting there because like they were trying to figure out what had happened to the echo, not what had happened to the woman. And so that was a fun twist. Whereas this, they were kind of like, "What happened to you, woman?" and different yeah. things. Um. The biggest difference that I can think of is like, like the level of power, the echo and pale wasn't, didn't seem to be doing anything to the girls. Like when Rose was like, oh, this echo is going to send out whatever it's feeling because misery loves company. I didn't really expect that. Um, okay. And like how she like made Blake super cold and then like burning hot. And like the other echo didn't seem to do anything like that to the kind of tears. I did um, like that extra detail, by the way, with, like, her burning hot and, mm-hmm. like, realizing that, like, oh, she actually froze to death. Um, right. Because that is true. I mean, well, no, like, a lot of times, like, if you've looked into um, cases where people have frozen to death, like, even, like, like on Everest or, I don't know, d- different places, you'll find them, like, half naked to naked because um, mm-hmm. they'll, have, like, be feeling like they're burning up so they'll take like everything off mm-hmm. um yeah. it's real awful it's pretty awful yeah yeah it's pretty bad yeah but yeah it was really neat i like okay. echoes yeah it was, it was cool yeah um so it'll be neat to see what the hatchet does if it like yeah you know just like turns things into ice or you know if it like yeah, I also wonder fires. if they'll be able to communicate with June haha, uh, anymore, because, um, I don't know, I really liked her. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we'll see as we go on. All right, I think it's time for Malia's bold and specific prediction. <gasps> do, 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 do. Okay, um, this one's either, like, real ridiculous or gonna get me so many points like either all of you are about to like lose your freaking minds or you're about to be like well that was dumb um (laughs) so i mean it could be both it could be both it could be both i think (laughs) i don't know if i should preface this yeah so i'm rereading this chapter and it's like oh yes the house was on a hill but it wasn't just a normal hill like the hill like has a tail that like goes back and curves down into the forest and i was like that's weird like that's a weird way to describe that. Maybe that's the way Canadians describe hills, but like hills don't have tails. I don't know. I was just like, what? (laughs) And I remembered, I was thinking about Laird and like the nukes and how Laird was like, maybe you just like bury the nukes and how grandma's like, we can't sell this house. And then how Miss Lewis without even prompting when they're like, Oh, she wants the woods and she can't like the briar girl wants the woods and marshes and she can't have them. Mr. Thorburn. I'm just like, yeah, okay. Like, there's a huge fucking demon buried under this house. <laughs> like, 
there's a huge demon or something, and it's buried under this house, and that's why we can't sell it, and we can't move it, and it probably has a tail. So it's basically like trapping this <laughs> then, demon in place. Um, uh-huh. And the house, they just like didn't build the house big enough yet to like cover the tail part. Well, I think the house is like doing its job. Um, mm, fair enough. The so house is like, keeping the demon down there. We don't need. We don't need it, like all this extra like frivolousness. Right. Of, like the house has stuff. managed to keep the demon trapped. And it's real big. And it's under this hill. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I like it. Um, any prediction on, like, I don't know, like, what kind of demon you think it would be? Um, big. So, like, just a big demon. Just I hope a- it has something to do with fire, because cliches are fun. <laughs> That's big demon. Big demon. <laughs> All right. We will see how that pans out. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, <laughs> All right. Uh Thank you for our bold and specific prediction. Um, wonderful as always. All right. Um, so this is Jenny here uh, covering last week's discussion question. Uh, Malia is on a socially distant uh, road trip, so uh, she's unable to record this. But so I'm going to be a little bit lazy in terms of <laughs> luckily the format kind of works um, with our discussion question. So. Our question was, would you rather be Blake, Rose, or Charles? So I'm basically going to separate it into the people that picked Blake, Rose, and Charles. Um, It's actually pretty even. We had two people each for Blake, Rose, and Charles, and one undecided. We'll just start with the undecided. It's Blake Tall. Basically, everyone's life sucks, so I don't know who I'd pick. Fair enough. You know, I agree. Everybody's life kind of (laughs) sucks with these stories. Um... So Blake, um, we've got Hero of Old Iron and Captain Rhino. They say they'd rather be Blake. Um, At the very least, he does have some agency. He can choose what he wants to do. And he does have a path forward, even if that path is really hard and kind of sucks. Next, Rose. um, We've got Lord of Eye and Demiurge. Comes down to she is somewhat safe in the mirror. And ultimately, Blake and Charles have a lot of trauma. It'd be nice to avoid that. So... Rose is a good step in terms of minimizing the amount of trauma you have. Um, And then last but not least, even though a lot of people would say that it's least, uh, Charles can't really get more negative karma. And there is less chance for death than Blake, at least. Um, So that's why Rathel, sorry if I butchered that, and Beard of Valor chose Charles. Now, on to our discussion question for the week. So... Is there a way for Blake and Rose to accumulate power that isn't morally reprehensible? Also, is there a moral way to deal with echoes like June? So let us know what your thoughts are, um, either in our Reddit thread um, or on Twitter, or you can email us. Whatever you'd like. We'd love to know your thoughts. Yeah. Struggle with the moral quandaries like I did. Yay. Yes. (laughs) Yay. (laughs) All right. Well, thanks for listening, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with your friends, and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to support Wildbo as he continues to write fantastic stories, go to patreon.com slash wildbo. You can follow the pod on Twitter at Pale Comparison or send us an email at paleincomparisonpod at gmail.com. Keep an eye out for our Reddit thread in r slash parahumans where you can answer our discussion question and share your thoughts on this episode. In addition, if you'd like to see all of my predictions laid out, check out our episode description for a link to our prediction tracker. All right. Our fun fact for the week. Woo! Apparently goosebumps, or as we call them in Hawaii, chicken skin, um, are meant to ward off predators. So, granted, they don't really work that great anymore because we're not as hairy as we used to be. But apparently, back in the day, um, our ancestors were very hairy. So, (laughs) when we got goosebumps, basically make them look larger because all the hair would stand up. So, help scare off the predators. Um, Yeah, most of us. I mean, some people are really hairy. So, maybe that worked for some people pretty well. Not quite that well for Near Malia, unfortunate. Well, actually, it's fortunate. It's fine. We don't need to do that. But 
<laughs> I don't need to be, I'm glad I'm not that quite that hairy, but, but yeah, now you know. Now you know. Anyway, <laughs> bye. Bye. Glad he's he said the thing about keeping the blood from clotting because I missed that. So I'm glad you saw that too because I'm glad you noticed that when you're rereading it because I don't remember that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I was like, shoot, like, yeah, like I used to draw blood cultures all the time when I was in the emergency room, and mm-hmm. blood cultures come in these like pretty big size size like like bottles because like a huh. normal a normal uh like test tube type of thing is maybe like this big and like or maybe like that big and that wide so it's like small a blood culture bottle is maybe like this big and like that wide wow so it's like a big difference it's like as opposed to getting like two or three mils you get like 10 mils and you get two you get two bottles for each blood culture you do is one is for like anaerobic bacteria ones for aerobic bacteria because it needs to, you need to see if like which ones grow if any grow and a lot of times you get two cultures of those but sometimes like i would just like draw if i didn't have like the bottles with me i would just draw up like a syringe of 10 just to get it because like you pretty much have to like draw that the first time you poke somebody mm. otherwise it might get contaminated but so like sometimes I just draw the 10 mil syringe and like leave it capped on the side. And if you didn't have, I found this out the hard way once, but like, if you didn't like get it uh, fast enough, it would potentially clot up and you could try to get a really large gauge needle and shove the blood through. But most of the time that would not work. Wow. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, for blood cultures, they're just looking for bacteria. So I don't think it really matters that much in terms of that. But like other things, like if you're trying to get a sodium level um, or if you're trying to get like, just see what your blood levels are, that ain't going to work with a bunch of clots. And then you have to poke the patient again and they get mad or, you know, Mm -hmm. or just use their IV again. But that's really interesting. Um, how would you feel about if I put that at the end of the podcast as like a fun little like bonus after the outro? Because that's really kind of cool. Sure. Okay. I'll try to remember. Okay. Write it. If it seems that interesting. It's hard for me to know what sounds interesting sometimes. I mean, I like, think it's cool. It's kind of interesting. Oh. I know. <laughs> like I mean, anybody listening would be like, uh, or like any nurses would be like, uh, you did what? <laughs> <laughs> you're like Ugh. well i just think it's like that's why you knew and that's why you asked and it's sort of fun like and i mean like so much of what nurses do is like practical learning um you we can't do learn it all and yeah. like immediately you know yeah it's like a lot of, why i mentioned the heparin earlier because i realized after like no one's gonna know what the fuck that is heparin is um a blood thinner medication um like some of our procedures that we do in ir where i work you know we do um bone marrow biopsies which is one of ours Mm. where you basically like drill into you call the right ilium it's kind of like your back like hip bone but we go in through the back we drill and basically pull up pull out like the marrow um and like the blood with within the bone and one of the prep things to do for that is like you get heparin and put it into like the syringes and stuff like that um Hmm. so that way like it doesn't stick to the inside of the syringe it also like helps it keep from clotting cool um it'd probably fuck with the practice though (laughs) yes (laughs) um and it would only last for so long too but yeah but yeah i'm sure nicola had special anti-clot runes or something or she was shaking everything like crazy <laughs> as she was going home like woohoo just to shake a shake a shake shake like little blood maracas you know <laughs> until she got to her like little circles be like don't clot on me don't clot you motherfuckers and then, yeah 
I'm dying. Medicine. 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 I don't get paid like the doctors, but it's okay because I don't got as much responsibility. 